Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Ryan Evely Gildersleeve. I'm an associate professor and department chair of the Higher Education Department. It is my honor to welcome you all to our fourth annual Higher Education Leadership Speaker Series. Yeah! Right off the bat, I want to acknowledge the generous support of our co-sponsors. They are listed at the bottom of the flyer slash program that was available for folks to choose not to pick up, I see, um, at the table with the sign-in sheet. So um, hopefully you can find that sometime in the evening. I do want to uh, make one correction. Uh, one of our co-sponsors is the Department of Sociology and Criminology rather than Criminal Justice. Uh, also, I'd like to share my deep appreciation for everyone who has helped in bringing this year's events to fruition, including the higher education faculty, as well as uh, Eric Merrick, Joshua Davies, Damian Macias, Megan Stribling, Lori Westerman, Alejandra Martinez, Kelly Schlebach, Brenda Cifuentes, and of course, the Higher Education Department's Academic Services Associate, Ms. Anna Millies. Can we all give a big round of applause for everyone? I have two quick announcements before I introduce our, our, our speaker for the evening. Uh, one is that uh, to remind, particularly because we have a number of alumni in the audience, we, would lo we love when you come back to events, we love when you come back to visit. We have two big events coming up that we'd like you to extend a formal invitation right now for you to join us at. One is on March 7th at 5 p.m. and that is our community poster presentation where winter quarter classes, particularly the college access class, highlights the community partners that they've been working with um, around access choice and equity concerns for the past quarter. And also our 2018 public policy forum is going to happen on May 10th and 11th. And we'll have a whole slew of events tied to that and announcements forthcoming, but please mark your calendars for March 7th for the community poster presentation and May 10th and 11th for our um, public policy forum. Tonight, we're here for the Higher Education Leaders Leadership Series. The speaker series was established by the higher education faculty in order to bring leading voices in the field to DU in the hopes of disrupting normative and taken for granted assumptions about higher education research, policy, and practice. We name a visiting scholar each year who joins us for one to three days and spends time with our students, our faculty and staff, and oftentimes uh, or occasionally with administrative professionals from across the campus. It is, my deep, it is a deeply personal privilege for me tonight to introduce our 2018 visiting scholar, Professor Pat Patricia McDonough from UCLA. Okay, yeah, that's good. I have a lot more, so if you do it after every paragraph, we're never going to get out of here. <clears throat> Not that she's undeserving. Professor McDonough's uh, classic study of social class, organizational context, and college choice has stood the test of time in its major contributions and its relevance to the field. Published 20 years ago, Choosing Colleges, still available on Amazon, altered the landscape of how we've come to know, come to know and conceptualize inequality and college choice through its methodological, theoretical, and practice-based contributions. Methodologically, McDonough's study was one of only a handful of qualitative studies being conducted in the area at the time, and the first to examine college choice from an organizational perspective. Her case study approach to studying how schools as organizations structured inequality in the college choice process and outcomes of students was the first to combine qualitative data with organizational theory in building new understandings of college choice. Theoretically, McDonough introduced the sociology of Pierre Bourdieu to the study of higher education. Harnessing the explanatory power of concepts such as cultural capital, cultural field, and habitus, McDonough's study demonstrated how Bourdieuian sociology could powerfully reveal the structuring of inequality as a feature of organizational practice and the individual level consequences that resulted from such practices. 
Likewise, McDonough introduced Paul DiMaggio's concept of bounded rationality as yet another theoretical tool for understanding how social forces collude to level the college-going aspirations of low-income, first-generation, and students of color. While these ideas are seemingly omnipresent in higher education research today, these concepts were novel 20 years ago at the time of choosing college's original publication. In terms of practice, McDonough exposed the influential role that college counseling has played in producing, mitigating, and or exacerbating inequality in students' college choice outcomes and processes. College counseling remains a key mediator in college opportunity. McDonough's work laid a solid foundation from which most research on college counseling today is built. Cumulatively, she combined these methodological, theoretical, and practical contributions in order to establish the concept of a college-going culture. Something ubiquitous, this phrase, coined and conceptualized, developed by McDonough, regularly referenced and applied within college access research practice and policy and college outreach today. Put simply, Choosing Colleges and Patricia McDonough's work remain one of the most influential texts on the study of inequality and college choice in higher education. A simple Google Scholar search suggests it has been cited over 2,000 times. It regularly appears on reading lists of core coursework and comprehensive exams in higher education graduate programs, as well as courses in sociology, org theory, and qualitative methods. But Pat McDonough's influence does not end there. Indeed, it barely began. Since choosing colleges, she has led the field and broken ground in looking at how market forces influence college access college admissions, and college choice. She's looked at college affordability and generated new understandings of how the meanings of money can differentiate across different demographic groups and therefore play different roles in their college choice processes. She is presented on Capitol Hill around social and cultural capital. She was the keynote speaker in Lisbon at the International Sociological Association she served on the board of directors for the National Association of College Admission Counseling from 2008 until 2010. Among her numerous awards, I want to highlight two that I know she is most proud of. First, the UCLA Achievement in Teaching Award. Second, the 2012 Ash Mentoring Award. Upon receiving this award, the first thing that Pat stood up and said was that she wanted to, quote, I want to thank Ash for honoring mentoring. I believe it is one of the most important things that we do. It is the thing that builds community, keeps us honest, and keeps us current. In her tenure at UCLA, Pat chaired, has chaired 60, over 65 doctoral committees and served on an additional 85, producing over 35 faculty members each marked by Pat's unique recipe for success that includes values of rigorous research, personal integrity, and professional humility. Some of us learned more of those lessons, more of parts of those lessons than other parts. <laughs> I consider myself blessed to be one of those privileged 30, 65 and to have had the career-long opportunity to learn from, contribute with, and develop into an ever stronger scholar by her mentorship. Her influence on our own department is palpable. Not only is choosing colleges a core text in our curriculum, <clears throat> but our college access praxis projects were initially modeled and inspired by a course that Pat developed at UCLA called the High School Advising Program, which I had the personal honor of serving as one of her TAs for back in the early 2000s. With all of that share, said and shared, please join me in welcoming Professor Patricia McDonough, our Higher Education Leadership Series Visiting Scholar for 2018. I guess I can die now. <laughs> um, thank you, Brian. Thank you, Anna. Thank you to the higher education faculty. It's really my privilege to be here. So um, I don't want you to see all my files like 
you know, like my daughter who just called and said, <coughs> what's our Netflix password? <laughs> All the essential things of life. Um, but um, so Ryan asked me to think about the past, the present, and the future. And so what I decided to do was to use the symbol of the Roman god Janus, who is always portrayed as looking forward and looking backward, but is symbolic of um, beginnings, endings, transitions in between. Um, Ryan suggested that I asked him about something that I wanted to do first. So part of what I want to accomplish today is to have you think about, you know, I'm lucky, right? I hit college access at just the right moment. Um, I couldn't have p predicted the time frame and what the uh, field needed at that time, but I chose the right topics and, and I, I was just saying earlier, one of the, per you can't hear? One of the perennial questions, is that working? Okay. One of the perennial questions is, why not deal with race? Why just white women as subjects? Why did you choose the things that you did choose? Well, metaphorically, and as far as I was concerned, actually, my advisor had the proverbial gun to the head and said, you can only choose two things. So she was basically more positivist in her approach to qualitative methods. And she said, you could choose more things to look at, but then in the end, you won't be able to tell what caused them. And so, um, you know, the, I gave up on the gender and just had one, and I gave up on, on uh, race and, and it had um, just class and organizational behavior because those were the things that uh, class was more predictive than race because there's confounding of poverty and race and poverty in, um, in white populations also. Um, but I also felt like up until that point, quantitative research was totally dominant. Um, and it was mostly, I'll, I'll get to that part later, but we knew a lot about what and how many. And we didn't know about why and how. You know, we knew that high schools were playing a major role. And through our status attainment research, we would know that if there were books in the home and that mothers and fathers' uh, college education, if they had it, or non uh, high school education, those were the predictors that were having the most power. And I was going to say I got up here without tripping, but apparently the danger still exists for me. See, when you think somebody's saying all these nice things, then they aren't telling about the things that you can't do, like stand up straight. Um, so I did the most rigorous piece of scholarship that I could do at that time. And as is often the case with graduate students, you want to fit everything into the dissertation. You haven't done this before, so you want to fit everything in. And so I learned, yep, so there, there are vigorous nods right now, um, I learned that over my career, or as we call your research agenda, I've been able to deal with rural students, urban students, suburban students, students um, fra, uh, who are some with disabilities. I've done college admissions personnel. Um, I've done uh, looking at different types of school, the college culture research that, that Ryan talked about, independent counselors, the list is long because I'm long. <clears throat> and so, not in terms of height, but in terms of how long I've been doing this. But one of the ways I wanted to, to, to talk today is about how to try and see things in new ways. You know, we know what to do when we enter a room like this. We, say hello to friends, we give hugs or handshakes, we eventually take seats probably only the third or fourth time that you're asked to do so. Um, we'll quiet down 
slowly, but we'll quiet down, will be attentive to the speaker, depending upon the time of day, like if it's just after lunch, you're really gonna have to fight that urge to just nod off, right? So we know the expectations. But what about when you see something that's so familiar, it's receded into the background, and you suddenly see it through somebody else's eyes? So the best way I can explain it is, for the first couple of years being at UCLA, I commuted up to San Francisco. Um, so we were split as a family, and you know, you do what you gotta do. Not to mention that we had Northern California attitudes about Southern California, weren't sure about moving to that den of iniquity. Not that I have anything against dens of iniquity. Um, but uh, as I told Ryan, it's so far back that Southwest had fares on sale for $29. <laughs> And so I was taking, I was flying home one, one Thursday night. And I'm there, pull, immediately pull out work, start working while I'm waiting in the area by the gate. And I see kind of off in the distance, not really paying attention, a father with a young son, probably about six. And um, I didn't really notice them until later when he began using his outside voice for every conversation he and his dad were happening, were having. And as it was, was turning out, the father was putting him on the plane in the care of a flight attendant, and he was gonna be, assumedly, his mother on the other end. Um, well, when we got on the plane, he was two rows behind me. And, you know, we're all working jerks, right? So we're there reading, playing on the iPad, you know, just whatever all in our own little worlds. We know these things take forever. We know that it's gonna go faster if we don't actually sit around thinking, that, you know, we gotta take off. So he gets seated, finally somebody's sitting next to him, and he's saying, you know, so when is it, when is it gonna take off? And the person said, I don't know, I'm guessing, because he said, what do you mean you don't know? And, you know, we're there 10 minutes later, it's like, I thought we were gonna be going. How long does it take? What, what are they waiting for? And all of a sudden you hear, traffic? How, th how do planes get caught in traffic? What traffic is there? It's just other planes, right? So, you know, it was one of those flights that were really delayed. So then they back up a little bit. His excitement is growing and he's saying, we're moving, we're moving. And then, you know, you get back out of the space and get stopped right at the end of that alley, right? We're, more traffic? Why was there more traffic? I thought the traffic got better. So this goes on until we're, we're at the turn down and the, last, the first plane ready to go. Stopped again. And he said, when are we gonna go? I wanna do this. And all of a sudden, the time has passed, but all of a sudden he says, we're moving, we're moving, we're going faster, we're going faster. We're flying! <laughs> That's when you know you're stiff and he's alive. You know, he's experiencing, he's seeing something. I mean, really, who wants to sit there and think, really this thing with a couple hundred people is gonna take off and go in the air, right? But that's seeing something anew. That's seeing, so when I'm doing my research, I'm trying to figure out what's a new way to approach this? What, what haven't I looked at? So one of the things I've done over time, I'm not talking about the book, but if you want me to, I will, um, is to say, let's look at the whole field. Because what we do a lot of times is we look at individuals making the decisions in the high schools or the colleges that are influencing the decision by preparing them or not preparing them, by admitting them or not admitting them. Well, there's a whole bunch of people out there, right? So it really says, what, what are the other players that sometimes have dramatic effects on what we do and how we do it? So I called it the entrepreneurial admissions sector. So it can include something not entrepreneurial, which is like the college board, ETS, ACT, those things. They're, they're not entrepreneurial. They've been around for a while, and they know how to make a lot of money every single year. But there are people who are small private counselors. There are people who take kids on tours to colleges. There, I mean, it's hard 
not to bump into a coach for college, somebody who's going to help people prep for the tests. Um, you know, the high school teachers are helping students with their essays in and out of classrooms. And we don't look very much at them. And I'll just tell you one story about the fact that in fields, there's reciprocal relationships. Oftentimes, we don't think of individuals in the large schema of college access have much in the way of power. But when aggregates of individuals who are trying to maximize their own potential, they're not necessarily out to change the world, but their neighbor down the street had a cousin whose nephew's friend did this in their application process, and they got into the school that they wanted to do. So word on the street is a powerful piece of this. So to give a concrete example, um, when we think about the power of advanced placement, when I wrote the book, advanced placement wasn't that big an influence. But then what started to happen is the state of the art of college applications changes over time. Once everybody gets the same credentials, then there's no distinction between them. And so what started happening is in California, UC Berkeley de facto required it. Because of the GPA and the way you factor in the AP exam scores, you had to take APs. It was not in their policy, but you were not gonna get the GPA that would be competitive. In Southern California, um, a group of scholars led by Jeannie Oakes documented that the, the quality of schools that didn't offer any APs. And so you're requiring something, even in a de facto way, and yet you're not providing the opportunity. To cut a long story short, the outcome of that was um, that the governor gave money to start APs in every high school in California. What then happened is places like Harvard and the like started requiring a score of five, no longer a score of three. And um, California then represented one-sixth of all AP exam course taking. So suddenly AP wasn't as powerful to help distinguish you. And that's when IB, the International Baccalaureate, came along. So we tend to think of powers from the, you know, the large institutions have power, but individuals too, not in a planful way. It's not like everybody said we're all going to take APs or demand APs, but if we're trying to get in, whenever there's a scarcity of resources, and if you consider a selective college admissions to be that scarce resource, then people have to invite and invent new ways of being I was looking at Ryan's bookshelf and there's a book, The Best of the Best, or as I like to call it in those schools, choosing the lucky from the worthy, right? I mean, UCLA has 114,000 applicants right now, and of that, maybe 20,000 are going to be selective, selected. The interesting thing is probably at least 10,000 of those students, UC is their backup. UCLA is their backup. It's the backup to Berkeley, and it's the backup to Stanford and the Ivies. And so when you think about the people who are actually going to go there, it's not very many. But how are you going to make it into that pool that everybody says is impossible? So back in the day, when, when the book was coming out, um, we looked at, or now using field, we can look at the changes in, the, in student demographics over time. We can also look at enrollment management and marketing, affirmative action struggles, um, how counseling, and effectively college counseling has been divested by public schools in the United States. Um, and then we look for all of these things and how they have entered the market. I can't tell you the number of times people call me up because they have a program or an app for college counseling. And the state-of-the-art research now in this field is economists who are trying to develop intervention programs 
and testing out if we give you targeted information, not just sell your address when you take one of those tests to anybody and everybody who will want it, but if we give targeted information based on your demographics that we have for when you filled out all the forms for taking those tests, if we give you something that says at, at these, we've picked out these eight institutions for you, and if you apply to them, the chance of you getting a significant aid package is really quite high, and they'll give them some of the specifics. So I'm also, if I tell you any details, I'll be killed, but I'm on the National Advisory Board for the current Upward Bound study, and that they're trying alternative forms of counseling. And when you're needing information, when you're distraught, is a piece of paper gonna do it? We underestimate the emotion and the emotion work that goes on in all of this. And I don't think we can codify, I think we can close some of the gap on information, but this is not a task of just information. What we can tell you is, if you think about this, there's no other field of so social policy that I can think of, doesn't mean it doesn't exist, where we would put billions of dollars in and have unchanged gaps of disparity for 60 years. But for as much as the numbers of people going to college and the number of colleges have grown, the gaps for racial and social class inequalities, those gaps have not closed at all. And that is horrific and worrisome, right? We're doing what we can think to do, but that's why we sometimes have to think anew about things. And although class may be stronger in its predictive power than race, you still can't dismiss what it's like to live in not only in a racialized society, but a racist society. And the messages, I mean, think about if you're a dreamer, all the discourse, all the going back and forth that's been going on, all the new sets of conditions in DC and in some states. So one of the things I wanted to bring to your attention is, um, I worked with somebody on an analysis of 30 plus years of journal articles in the major higher ed journals and the major sociology journals. Um, so from 1973 to 2004, there were 114 articles, which actually isn't all that much if you think about it. And I tried to look at how things were being studied. 70% were quantitative. 19 were policy pieces or literature review pieces or analysis of institutional documents. Only 4%, 4%, only four of them were qualitative. And the major categories were financial aid, policy and institutional analysis, student ability and achievement, college choice, family SES, non-traditional students and students of color. 40% um, of the articles in higher ed, and one sociological article focused on financial aid, which in and of itself, you know, higher education journals should be focusing in on that more. Uh, and most of them were focusing on black-white differences so that we were still in that binary. And all were quantitative. And the second largest category in higher education was about college choice. Um, now, any of you who've been in a higher, uh, higher ed program know the work of Hostler et al. that it's about students' um, predisposition, search, and choice. And I, I consider Don Hostler a valuable colleague, really valuable. But even he has admitted that he, he comes from a psychological background, his training, and you know, there's more to it than just that, this was around when I was starting the research on choosing colleges, and I thought, you know, there's more. Because I was a graduate student, as growing up, I grew up in projects. As a graduate student, I was at Stanford. And you want to talk about looking at things suddenly with new eyes. And people would say, you know, when I went to college, most of the kids in my high school wanted to go to Princeton or Harvard or <coughs> Yale. And I just kept thinking most of the people in my high school went to Gillette's, the factory down the street. And it's that thinking about things the way that other people aren't and thinking about, 
I admit the usefulness of predisposition search and choice, but I wanted to investigate why the certain schools were you were predisposed to. And as, as you know in the book, there's, there's the Mission Cerritos School where, you know, where the, the counselors and teachers say flat out, we haven't really done a good job training you and getting you ready, so you probably all should go to the community college and brush up your skills so that you can make it to a four-year school. Every school has a different way of being. Um, now, in sociology, they were pretty much looking at eventual attainment and effects of schools. But again, it was the what and the how many, not the high and, and the why, the how and the why. They could have done the high, but they didn't. Um, so we started seeing more sociological articles on race in 1978 on related to college choice. Um, then came multi-ethnic college choices. And then uh, for higher ed, they branched into non-traditional students who are now the norm. Uh, and um, sociology didn't tackle that issue. But it's back to my point e earlier. Why have we been able to make no progress in narrowing the gaps? Some of you in this room may have devoted your life to practitioner work, to scholarly work, to policy work on these issues. None of us wants to feel like, you know, what's it for it if it doesn't change? And it tells us that we haven't yet found the most relevant pieces. And as Ryan said, the other piece of it for me has been this grow, growing private sector. Now, there was an article in the Harvard Business Review, not something I read regularly, um, that um, talks about privatization is when you have a public market and all of a sudden private providers come in to provide services. And, you know, honestly, from their point of view, why wouldn't you? If nobody's answering people's counseling needs, why, if you had the means, why wouldn't you buy the services of our private counselors? I, excuse me, a long time ago got, got tired of talking to journalists who wanted to talk about private counselors, and I said, they're a great thing. I just wish everybody had one, right? It's, it's the state of the art of what you can do with somebody. And it attends to the emotion work as well as the intellectual work, as well as putting the stamps on something and putting it in the mail. Nowadays, not so much, okay? So getting the computer fired up and, and clicking submit. Um, but when you go to providers, what you lose is the accountability to the public schools. We lose that the fact that we have goals that say, we want to look at our whole population and have optimal outcomes for the society and the individuals in, in it. We also want to have fair access to desired social goals, uh, goods, and we need to have distributive justice. And so those goals have become further and further out of reach. Now, one of the ways that I've tried to do things in, in my research is to say that sometimes we need field correctives. Sometimes we need to look that bird's eye view and say, not that any one person has to do it, but what are the things we're not attending to that we should be? Now, students are making individual choices, scholars are making individual choices, practitioners are ma making individual choices. A lot of people are saying, I, I know it's, it's, it's supposed to be this way, but I can see that it's not. This is what I'm gonna choose to work on. Also, don't never underestimate the getting of tenure and what journals will, will read or not. I myself, my first piece of work was published in the Journal of College Admissions. And I've tried all throughout my career to alternate scholarly research journals and practitioner journals. Um, and I served, at, uh, as, as Ryan said, on the NACAC board. They instituted them. I mean, I gotta give them props. They instituted a position for a scholar so that they could be better connected to what the current research is. And that's pretty great that a practitioner association put that as a goal and codified it um, in their board of trustees. But I also do those kinds of things because I learn a lot 
and I stay current on what's going on. Um, and there need to be a lot more of those bridge building and going back and forth. But periodically, we need to have that bird's eye view and say, I think we should do a little bit more of this or a little bit more of that. And to a certain extent, that's what I was seeing when I designed uh, with the gun to the head, the uh, choosing colleges. Um, and certainly, there are more things we could do with individual groups right now. We could do more synthesizing of the research across different um, ethnic groups, uh, across rural and migrant students, non-traditional students, students in foster care, students with disabilities, and a bunch of other things that I'm not thinking about, right? I can't identify them all, and luckily, it's education is a field where there are people with a lot of passion and um, a commitment to social justice and are constantly thinking about what the needs are. Now, one of the needed field correctives is more research done from the perspective of critical race theory. Um, when I've worked with Bourdieu's work, I, I've focused in on moments of inclusion and exclusion. How is it happening? It's not like there's some orange-haired figure who's saying, you know, let's, let's do this or let's do that. It's, it's happening because the systems are set in place. We also, we often, when things have been around for a while, we forget to challenge certain things. I'm going to talk in a minute about meritocracy. But, um, and people oftentimes misunderstand capital. Um, and the various forms of it. And Bourdieu never said one capital is better than another. He says that all capital has to be displayed in a, not displayed, converted in a particular field. So if I wanted to score Super Bowl tickets, about all I know of football is that there is a Super Bowl, by the way. But I couldn't use my cultural capital that I use in academia to get those football tickets. If somebody here, I asked this class uh, in my undergraduate class last week, somebody, her neighbor growing up is somebody who's now in the NFL, and so she said, I can get them. Um, but you have to understand, cultural capital is, first of all, hidden on purpose. But it's the only thing really valued by school systems, right? It's the one thing they don't teach. Do they actually teach a class on how to get into college? Are all the things you're supposed to be doing along the way? There might be a handful of schools that do, but that's the hidden knowledge. And parents are all the time complaining about why do they keep it hidden from us. So part of that would be identifying how when I, when I work with students, we play poker as a way of explaining capitals. You know, you know, dealt five cards, your hand at birth, you're converting some through the high school years, which will get you into, maybe you've got the winning hand that's going to get you into a Harvard or something like that. But it's always better to, to be more concrete with things. Uh, but jokers, depending on, you know, if you're a purist with pokers, jokers stay in the card box, they don't, they don't get played. Um, but I wanted to highlight, I think I've got four people who I think are exemplars for as we're in this new century going forward and as we think about inequality in college access and how to do it, how we can not only just identify where the moments of exclusion are but how to transform things. So the first is research by a sociologist named uh, Roberta Espinoza. She talks about pivotal moments. It's very rigorous sociological theory research. And what she does is she really looks at um, the pathways along the way and how students from worth, working class but also ethnic minority backgrounds, primarily Latinas in her research, make it. There tends to be a moment. Maybe somebody said, you're a smart kid. You should think about going to college. Maybe a teacher says, this is a fabulous paper, you should think about doing something with it. It's those little moments of life that can make a world of difference. I would bet that most of you have some of those moments in your life 
when one thing changed, one person helped you to change. But what Espinoza is saying, you gotta think about the encounters and the relationships. Um, and think about how that then along the way helps you to accumul accumulate procedural knowledge about attending college or interpersonal support. She also talks about the timing, the duration, and the impact of pivotal moments. If that person signs on to your team forever, then that's, that's a resource that is with you for the long term. Sometimes it's just that person who catches your attention and helps you to see your opportunities anew, and then somebody else continues to help along the way. But she, in her book, she also translated into concrete practices for people in outreach programs and in schools can do to help students. Now, one of the things I wanna say about outreach programs is the research is pretty mixed, but there's a couple of uh, federally funded uh, uh, upward bound program studies that show that they make a difference they make a difference for the people who have what would be considered the lowest potential coming in. So for the, the sort of middling grades, not the valedictorian, um, and they have a lasting impact. Um, you might have heard of this author that I wanted to talk about, Ryan Gildersleeve. And I have to tell you, a lot of the time in graduate school, I had no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and, and sometimes I would nod and then quickly go online and look things up afterwards, right? Because he's, he's in my area, but not in my area. And that's what's the great thing about all of this. When you come in with a new perspective, you see something. Who was using literacy practices and looking at migrant students in the college opportunities? Not really going on. Am I okay? Um, I'll stand better, stand better. Um, but what Ryan did is sort of looked at multiple identities that, that are embodied in single persons. Race, class, language, geography, immigration, um, and reframed it using a Vygotskyan framework um, and really looking at literacy practices and how, you know, in its simplest form, you know, you can use writing as, not the only thing, but the many pieces, use writing as an everyday practice to help students understand more about college access. He also focused on how students negotiate their everyday lives. I'm a big fan of everyday lives you get so much that you wouldn't otherwise get. Um, and in a culturally mediated world. I mean, when you're from a non-dominant eth ethnicity or social class, if you're you know, in poverty, how many people who have experienced poverty in their lives have heard, I don't know how we're gonna afford it, we're just gonna figure it out, right? When you're not the norm, and you don't know how to do something, you just, and you know, parents are honest with their kids, I don't know, you know, we'll get there and we'll figure it out. I have no idea how this is gonna happen. And it's a leap of faith born of structural constraints. We don't have the money to do that. Or I didn't go to college, so I can't tell you. I just know you have to go. But it's important um, because as Ryan does, he illuminates the sense making that people have around college going and how that gets embedded in daily routines. Now, a, a third person is Lanny Guinier, who's a um, well-known legal scholar. Um, and I'm not, I'm not deeply read in the law. But what she does is she really tackles the whole notion of a meritocracy. So you know the meritocracy, right? Work hard achieve, you'll be rewarded, right? We don't say anything about the gross disparities between high schools. We don't say anything about the lack of access to extra school opportunities, right? It's not a level playing field. You wouldn't take as your first 
If you were a runner, you wouldn't go to the Olympics in your first run, right? Most people would never go to the Olympics. And so, you, you, you know, everybody, they either have the body that will do it or not, but a lot of that, my daughter was a gymnast for six years. And, you know, you practice and practice and practice, and you learn some things and you don't, and you keep working on them, and, um, you know, it takes practice, but it also takes access to people who can train you and people who can support you and in some cases money. I mean if you want to go the distance in a lot of those sports um, in, in Olympic sports, you know, you need money. You need specialized conditions. When I, I, one of the things I did along the way, I did, I ran an upward bound program while at Stanford and then I also worked in the admissions office during the reading season. Uh, so I could see what it was like when you're choosing a class. And I got to the point where I was like, so you went to the Olympics. Did you medal? You know, I mean, you become inured to expecting more. And it's, it's pernicious, actually. But she says, you know, the systems of elite education are designed for people who have all the advantages in the world. And when the Ivy and Ivy-like institutions offer, we'll pay your full tuition if your family makes up to $150,000 and between one hundred and fifty dollars and two hundred, dollars will pay part of it. Well, they don't have a very big uptake on that because they don't have poor, underrepresented minorities in their applicant pool because people are already filtering themselves out. They're going to be different than me. They're not like me. They're going to be mean to me. You know, there's a story in a journalistic report about the fact that, you know, somebody called up someone who was in the projects and said, you know, I want to bring out Laura Ashley sheets and towels and stuff. Will that match what you're bringing? And it's like, is that a third roommate, Laura Ashley? Um, and so she's saying we think about merit all wrong. First of all, we're focusing backwards. It's not just what you've achieved. It's not factoring in, for the most part, the conditions you had to achieve, right? So academic, when they look at the curriculum, uh, selective admissions officers will say the student took the best they could do in their school. But it's still not accounting for the fact that they didn't have much to challenge them in their schools. And who knows if they had had that curriculum, what their GPAs or test scores would have been like. But Guineer says, we ought not to look just at what students have achieved up till now, but who are the people who are going to graduate having done the work and the service to a larger public good um, in doing this. Now, her argument is much more complex. And she's also very, a very creative um, writer, the, her first chapter is entitled Adonises with a Pimple. Um, and so um, she certainly, uh, I enjoy and learn from her work. Another is a new junior colleague of mine at UCLA, Ozan Jaquet. You know, I grew up in the East Coast, so I studied French, which is really useful to me in California. He, he came along and I thought, I'm going to know how to pronounce that name. And he, then he said, no, it's more the Huguenots of France. And so it's like, OK, whatever. Um, so he focuses in on organizational analysis, which obviously I do too. But he also uses data science and econometrics and higher education finance and policy because he's really looking at it from the institutional side of side of this whole thing. Now, we have a lot of institutional researchers who do enrollment management, but not generally people who are full-time scholars and devoting more time to it and making it more widespread and not just institution-specific. So he identifies the iron triangle of enrollment management, which is the balance of enrollment goals of access, academic profile of the institution, and tuition revenue. So, if they want to stay in business, you have to increase the tuition. Now, I will tell you that right now, 
at UCLA, the state provides 16% of our budget. And that number has been dropping every year since I've been on the faculty. Um, so bringing in new forms of, re of revenue is important for us. Um, and then academic profile, you wanna get the best students because the best students will help you recruit the best faculty. It's all about the college rankings, right? I understand you had a seminar on college rankings. So it's all about the college rankings. So, and then you have um, enrollment management or the goals of access. Well, what his work goes on to prove is access for all tends to become symbolic goal and not an actual goal because the other two are gonna drive the equation. They're trying to do better in the rankings in your academic profile and trying to raise more money. And so what he's doing is basically saying, whenever I get an email from him, the bottom tagline is a quote from Joe Biden, um, don't tell me your goals, show me your budget. So what he's doing is, is calling them. He's also web scraping, which I know the term, I can't explain it, so please don't ask. Um, but he's web scraping to see where are these colleges and universities what high schools are they going to, to recruit students? And are they spending as much time in an inner city school in LA as they are in a suburban school in Westchester County, New York? And so he's really redirecting higher ed's attention to new ways of, of doing research on the web. He's, he's doing more with econometrics. He's not trained as an economist. He has picked up his skills along the way. He's using his knowledge of organizational theories. And um, he's testified before the California legislature. They haven't always liked what he's had to say and they don't follow his suggestions because they don't want to put more money into the state system. We're now what's called a a state-affiliated institution um, because they provide so little of the budget. Um, and so that is another exemplar of somebody who can see something a different way and change it. So what's most important about things, or why is it important, is that they show us the moments of inequality, but also possibly the moments of transformative learning that empowers students and their families and the educators who work with them. And with Guinier and Jaquette, they're taking a larger view of the ideologies and policies, and if you will, the hidden hands, the people who, metaphorically speaking, the hands of people who are, got, who are setting the terms of competition um, for what happens and how. Now, I have some slides on affordability, and I think it's getting late. So he's smiling, which means, yes, I didn't want to say so, but yes. Yeah, what, I'm not gonna do it with slides. If that's all right with you, you can have the slides if you want. But so up until a certain point, a couple of years ago, I had zero interest in financial aid. It just wasn't rocking my boat. But you know, you learn things from, from doing something that you hadn't done before. I realized I'd been teaching about the Higher Education Act of, um, or the one in 1972 for a number of years, a lot of years. And I realized I had this encounter in, in college. So 1972, I was a sophomore in college. <gasps> the other part of that is, oh, but she looks so young. <laughs> um, so it was January. Coming back, I had already taken out loans. California had, they would pay the tuition. We actually called it tuition, unlike my home state, which calls it a fee. Um, and I had two jobs. And so I went and said, I'm gonna have to drop out. Can't you do something? So meanwhile, I really went to school before the Higher Ed Act. There were the um, National Defense Student Loan as a result of Sputnik. Um, and the guy said, I'd been applying all this time, right? The guy said, oh yeah, we can do something for you. I said, you know, I was ready to argue. I had everything prepared. And he said, yeah, I see you have a brother here who's a freshman, does he need money too? I said, duh, you know, <laughs> same family. And you know, I realized that 
that that was a result of the High Red Act. And, you know, or something. It's, it's coincident, but maybe a little bit ahead of time, but they had more flexibility. I also ran, I realized it was a random moment. If I hadn't steeled myself up to go in and say, I can't do it without help, um, I, I wouldn't have gotten it. And other people didn't get it, um, even when I did. And, you know, I got issues with my brother. I got sibling issues just like everybody else. But, you know, he needed the money, too. He's also the, the, an academic and doesn't speak English. You know, I'll ask him, he's a geoscientist, I'll ask him, you know, where, uh, why do the rocks look like this where, in the canyon where I live? Three days later, I'll wake up from a coma, and he's still talking. <laughs> but let's talk about affordability. What I realized is the reason why I wasn't interested in doing research on financial aid is I couldn't find something that felt like I had an entry point. And then, working with a group of students, I realized that I, I could finally figure that out. Now, I have $20 in my wallet, and I'm not going to get it because that's a high potential for falling. But if I offered to give you 20 bucks now, or if you, you, I dropped my 20 bucks and one of you walked past it, would you pick it up? If it was a dollar? You know what, I see three heads moving and the rest of you are like, I'm not answering that. <laughs> when you were a kid, when you were like five, if a grandparent or an aunt or uncle or somebody said, here's a dollar, what would your reaction be? <laughs> right? Now, if I said a dollar, whatever, right? Our view and relationship to money changes over time. Also, we don't think about money differently. The faculty or administrators, given your suit, I'm, get, I'm making guesses about your relationship to money that might not be the same as the graduate students, right? They're the ones in t-shirts, not t-shirts only, it's cold here. Not really, but coldish, colder than LA. Um, at different periods in your life, you feel differently about money. Now, who can answer the question, what does college cost? Hmm? Right. You know, people, some people think about it in credit units at a community college. Some people, journalists will write about the annual or total bill for going to an Ivy League school. And even that isn't easy to calculate. There was an article in the New York Times last week about why it's so difficult to calculate, um, and they were looking at women's colleges in Massachusetts. And so what, you know, it, they basically, journalists have now discovered enrollment management and discounting. And so you don't know what you, you bargain, you use whatever resources, you say I got, I got an offer from someplace else. I can tell you what UCLA does. If they come back to negotiate the tuition with offers in hand from other institutions, UCLA, which is very competitive, will say, you need to make the decision that's right for you. Because we don't have the deep pockets that private institutions have, institutions with larger endowments. And so people often make decisions about affordability based on their current financial situation. So we're barely making it now. I don't know where we would get that extra money. Or I'm paying for private Catholic high school. It's some, but it's not usual private tuition. We can at least devote that money. I'm, I'm already not having access to it. And you know what might it cost? Everybody, first of all, we don't acknowledge the widely varying information that's out there. We measure every year how many, they ask people how much college costs. People will say, is it with the books? Is it the whole package? Is it just tuition? Is it room and board? So they've become savvy about the ways in which we camouflage things, intentional or not. Um, we're not making it clear. And generally, parents 
overestimate a college education by a factor of two, and students overestimate it by a factor of three. So the, the classic example in some of the data is there was a student says it cost about a Benz a year. Now, I didn't even know what a Mercedes-Benz was when I was in high school, but you know people have that sense. And in the business world, we don't market Kias to a Lexus audience or vice versa. We know about market se segmentation. You know, think about what you see in commercials. You know, with $1,500 down, a rebate, and a loan that's this amount, you can afford this car, whatever this car is. So they try to tell you how it's going to fit into your monthly budget. And we say, apply, maybe you'll get in, and we'll figure out the money later. And poor folks don't do something, particularly when it could smash their children's dreams. They don't do it on, we'll figure it out later. They can decide to figure it out later, but there isn't the social trust in the institutions. Because the word on the streets are, they say you need 15,000, they're gonna give you 10,000 at most, and most of that's gonna be in loans. And there are also, in the financial aid world, myths about Latinos are loan averse. No, there are some cultural values about not borrowing outside the family, and you know, collectively reaching out to members of the family to try and pull it together. But it doesn't mean they're loan averse. And they also have calculations in their head. If it's the right school, if it's a high state of school that will make a difference versus the community college, then they're not going to take the risk here. They will take the risk here. And so that's what a sociocultural notion of affordability is. If we keep collecting the data and we know that what we're doing is not changing people's perceptions of affordability, then we got to do something different. Because if we keep getting the same results, it's guaranteed failure. So there were, I did have a last slide, but basically, um, from memory, as, as good as that is, think big, start small. Think about seeing something in a new way. Never or let's put it in a positive frame. Make sure you make rigor your friend in your methods and design. Get a good theory. A good theory is a good, well thought out theory, but it's what's good for you. Okay, so, and in this kind of audience, more than half of you have probably had an eye exam, am I right? Okay, what's the machine that they put in front of you, you know, switching lenses? It's called a four optic. Now, I get test anxiety when we get to the part, is this lens better or is this? <laughs> well, I like that one because of, uh, it seems clearer, but this one, everything seems bigger, right? That's, that's what you're doing when you're choosing a theory. It's helping you to see the problem you've already identified and which one is going to fit best. It's going to help you figure out what level of analysis. Are you looking at individuals, organizations, policy? It's going to help you to figure out qualitative or quantitative methods, and then which quantitative or which qualitative methods. And it's going to help you identify the concepts used with your theory to figure out the specific things like capital or conversion or whatever it is that you're doing as you go along. But you too can have a runaway 2,000 citations, maybe 100 books a year, 20 years later, book. Um, it's the academic world. So we're not competing with, what's that, Fire and Fury or whatever the new book out. <laughs> we're not, the academic markets are small. If it's around in 20 years, that's a good thing. But you're not going to put an addition on the house, right? So just do it. Do what you want to do, do it well, and don't look back. Thanks. Thank you again, Patricia McDonough. One more round of applause. And at this point, uh, Alejandra and Kelly will be around with microphones to moderate some Q&A uh, for any questions that folks might have. Thank you. For those of you who are of a certain age, Phil Donahue method. Thank you. <laughs>
<laughs> Come on back to the mic. Thank you. Or not. Okay. Um, so, Pat, I don't know if you had the same reaction I did with the twenty with the study that came out or the survey that came out in September that showed that the white rural individuals saw college costs as not being the majority of them, sixty five percent I think that was, showed that college was just not worth it. And it was a specific demographic that kind of took me back in light of what has happened politically. Um, how do you think this occurred in light of all the work that has been done over the last two decades. What have we been doing wrong in academia or in the media that has created this backlash within this population to say college is just not worth it? Thanks. I can actually answer that one. Um, <laughs> so with rural folks, um, and I was involved in a study of uh, the two counties in Calif Northern California, you know, the people who want to be part of the Jefferson Free State, not part of California. Um, and it was, they were so far apart that in order to do data collection one day, I had to, had to take a helicopter to make it to the various high schools. Now, that is not true to qualitative methods and being unobtrusive, but what, what they talked about a lot is, first of all, Go to college for what? There's a limited number of doctors in their towns. Um, there's almost no major industries except logging, which is in a downswing, a major downswing. Um, and so there, there are first all the barriers of going away. Uh, it would be three and a half hours to the nearest Cal State University five or six hours to the nearest UC, longer to a private institution of, of note. They had a, they, first of all, they're among the students who are most eligible to go to California State Universities and UCs. Excuse me, they have the highest states, rates of eligibility. They've taken all of the courses, they have high GPAs, they've taken the SATs or the, uh, ACTs. Um, generally, the, these areas are so small that in typical families, the wife will work at the high school and the, the husband will work at the um, junior college. And they went, but besides teaching medicine, some little bit of health industry, lower level but college ed educated um, folks, these are places where the county government um, or city government will be one person. Um, there's law enforcement, but there, there's not jobs. So to take the first step is first of all hard because you're gonna go to some place and really rural students are mocked at non-rural colleges. And they're assumed to be hicks and, um, and so their experiences are negative they're far away from home, it takes a long time to get back home, it's not easily accessible, there's little public transportation. They go and then they didn't want necessarily to leave their family and friends. And so the going back, for them, it's a calculus, and I'm not saying it's everybody, but it is a fact for certain segments of the population where it's not really gonna get them what they want. And for a lot of the students, one of the things that surprised me is because there's no, effectively, no public transportation, so then you have to buy a car to get to the community college and then you're locked into car payments and then it's like, well, you know, I can't keep doing this. So they tend to stop at a community college degree. I'm not saying every rural place is like that, but that is a part of uh, some rural population's approach to going to college. You go to college and then forego your life as you know it, or you go to college and don't put your degree to work, and therefore why? 
I don't know. Anybody else got a thought on that? We're all trying to figure out that demographic. And clearly, in terms of politics and social po policy, we haven't, um, haven't known that demographic very well. So it's another area for, for investigation. Now I know it's getting late, you wanna eat, maybe some of you wanna have a drink. Any questions? I really appreciate you coming and being so attentive, and I really appreciate you smiling and nodding. My undergraduate class every week is like, <laughs> you know, the, the movie face, and it's just this year, and I'm, it's like, what's happening? I have a question. Good. I actually have two questions. Um, my first question is regarding, you mentioned that you are serving on a committee or a board that is um, researching the effectiveness of the federal TRIO program, Upward Bound. Just Upward Bound. Okay, I was go that was going to be my first question, if you were also exploring the other federal TRIO programs, such as Educational Talent Search Program, or, no? Okay. Well, my second question is, in your research, um, have you also explored the effectiveness of summer bridge programs or first-year um, programs and how they may be effective when it comes to students and access? Well, I said earlier that the research isn't very good. If any of you have worked with outreach programs, you know it's very vulnerable funding and you know, you're getting the least amount possible. And I don't know of anything other than a federally funded program where they actually pay for evaluation. And I was on the University of California system-wide task force on evaluating outreach programs, and we eventually had to disband because there was no real evidence that we could point to. So we knew that somebody was enrolled in a program. We didn't know how many times it met, how many times that student was there. We didn't know what the experience was like when, it, when they were there. Um, if you're in an outreach program, chances are better than 50% you're in another outreach program. And none of them are measuring the impact of the school, which is where they spend 100% of their academic life, right? We, outreach programs, one of the big issues with outreach programs is you need your student to get into a rigorous set of courses and you're at the, you know, I mean, we don't know whether they're gonna get in. And you can go in to argue for your student but we don't know if they're gonna to get to see the counselor and spend any real time with the counselor. And a lot of upward bound programs will have tutoring um, to help out students, but um, it's very hard to do it when you don't have a copy of the book or the teacher is telling them one way and the program might have limited skills, that they're good skills, but they're not the skills that the teacher is using or the way the teacher wants the homework done. So it's been pretty, darn hard to get any rigorously designed evaluation program up and running. Anybody who's ever worked in an outreach program or been in one will be religious zealots about how effective they are. But we just don't have the evidence. And I used to run an upward bound program and I know the impact that it had on students. But can I prove it? No but we still keep doing it, right? All right, thank you. I appreciate you taking the time out of your days. Uh, sure. Thank you, everybody. Uh, there is some catering left if you want to help us clear that out. Um, otherwise, we will see you again on March 7th for our community poster day and May 10 and 11 for the policy forum. And the lunch and learn for higher ed students on Wednesday from noon to one. <laughs>